Today we're going to go over the Renaissance, the Italian Renaissance, from 1300 to 1600. We're going to look at what the precursors were to the Renaissance in the 1300s, and then how the early Renaissance began, and uh, quite a bit of the writing and art that makes up the Renaissance. Then we'll look at the High Renaissance and uh, take a look at what's going on in Rome and in Venice. The early Renaissance, we're really looking a lot at what goes on in Florence. We will have an assignment based on a video from the BBC on Vitruvius Man and idealized proportions. This is more or less a continuation of what we looked at with the ancient Greeks, where in the classical age, they were perfecting the human through idealization and also through mathematical concepts. And we're going to see how that comes into the Renaissance. Next week, we will look at the Northern Renaissance and the Reformation. And then I will show you a little bit at the end of the lecture how similar the Renaissance is to, obviously, as I said, the classical Greek sculpture. And then the next age, the Baroque age, is very similar to the Hellenistic sculpture that we've looked at. So we see this kind of movement from proportion and math to emotion, from logic to emotion. And we'll see it again in the Enlightenment. Uh, and then we'll see the emotional part in the Romantic era in chapter 11 and 12. So this is uh, something we find a few times. And it's certainly worth thinking about maybe why this might go on. So I want to start with the transition from medieval to Renaissance and then get into the early Renaissance here. But first, let me kind of describe what the Renaissance is. So the Renaissance means rebirth. It's a turning point between the medieval and modern times. It marks the revival of Greco-Roman culture and generally is spread from Florence to all the rest of the European West. More generally, it describes the broader intellectual re renewal and line of linear perspective and other techniques for ach achieving pictorial naturalism, from map making to ingenious systems of record keeping the age of the Renaissance, the period roughly from 13 to 1600, witnessed a spirit of self-conscious individualism in political and economic life, as well as in the arts. Money, fame, and power were now the motivating forces for men and women who, like their modern-day counterparts, easily reconciled their worldly pursuits with their religious beliefs. So the Renaissance is coming out of a century of European warfare, uh, a devastating plague, and yet nevertheless, the 15th and the 16th centuries saw the growth of the European nation states and the rise of a prosperous middle class, as well as the advancement of classically based education and celebrating classicism in art and architecture. There's a optimism for human potential in knowledge and pleasure inspired by this rebirth. So let's take a look at where we begin in the 1300s. So in the 1300s, the 14th century, there's a period of transition marked by a number of dramatic d developments. The struggle for survival against the bubonic plague, the long and debilitating war between England and France, and also the decline of the influence of the Roman Catholic Church. So the Black Death, the Hundred Years' War, and the Great Schism radically altered all of the aspects of Western European life that we would have seen in the Middle Ages, High Gothic uh, era. So there's a growing preoccupation with gender and class, and also a world 
that is looking for greater objectivity. The Black Death. So the bubonic plague struck Europe in 1347. It destroyed one-third to one-half of the population, originating in China and spread by Mongol tribes that dominate the vast area of that, world, of that part of the world. It disrupted long-distance trade, cross-cultural encounters, <clears throat> and comes to Europe from flea-bearing black rats infested on commercial vessels and was also seasonal. It would come and go based on seasons. So it was a disease that began in the lymph glands in the groin or the armpits, slowly filling with pus, turning black, a deathly black, thus labeled the Black Plague. And then once the boils and fever appeared, death usually came within two or three days. Traditional treatments such as bleeding the victims, fumigation, vapors of vinegar, none of this proved to work. Also, the church saying perhaps you brought this upon yourself through your own evils also was not helping things. So the absence of the understanding of bacterial infection in the medical profession um, really left people helpless. The plague hit harder in cities where a concentrated population and lack of sanitation made the disease more difficult to contain. So Europe between 1347 and 1375 nearly wiped out entire populations and the and psych psychological impact of the Black Death was traumatic and of course the economic effects were devastating. Uh, widespread death amongst the poor caused shortage of labor, greater demand for workers. European workers then wanted more money and better status. And also peasants took advantage of the opportunities to become tenant farmers on lands leased by lords in need of labors. So the whole feudal system is really suffering because Shortage of workers means the workers have more power. Others are going to flee their rural mansions for cities because jobs are now also readily available too. So this urban growth shows the kind of disintegration of mannerism and feudalism. All of Europe, though, was disadvantaged by climactic disasters caused by uh, crop failure, famine, and continuing demands of financially threatened feudal overloads, overlords. Violent working class revolts are the first examples of labor re rebellion in Western history. They broke out in France and England. In 1358, French peasants staged a angry po protest that took the lives of hundreds of noblemen before it was suppressed by the king. The, pre the Peasants' Revolt in 1381, led by Watt Tyler, was a, uh, described in the chronicles of the French historian Jean Frisson. From he lived from 1338 to 1410. Despite their ultimate failure, these revolts left their imprint on the social history of the West. They frightened landowners everywhere and lent an instability to class relationships. the rise of the constitutional monarchy. While the, pe the Peasant Rebellion achieved no immediate reforms, lower classes had taken a major step towards equality with the rest of society. England's laborers were not the first, though, to have contested the absolute authority of English monarchy. In 1215, the barons of the realm had forced King John of England to sign the landmark document called the Magna Carta, the Great Charter, which forbade the king from levying additional fuel taxes without the consent of the Royal Council. The Magna Carta also interpreted, it was also interpreted as guaranteeing other freedoms like trial by jury, and it asserted the primacy of law over the will of the ruler. 
Fifty years later, the English nobility, depend, demanding equal authority in ruling England, imprisoned King Henry III and invited middle-class representatives to participate in the Great Council, the Parliament. And this is the first example, then, of representational government. Parliament met frequently to raise taxes for England's war with France, and it bargained for greater power, including the right to initiate legislation. Peasants and labor still had no real political influence. However, in this century, we see the ground laid for a constitutional monarchy. We'll still have a king, but the king has limited power. So the Hundred Years' War from 1337 to 1453. This was fought entirely on French soil, and this was a larger and more protracted uh, war than any previous medieval conflict. The war was the result of long-standing English claim to continental lands. From the time that the Norman con conquest had happened, the kings of England had held that lands in France belonged to them. So the English claimed the French throne at the death of Charles IV, the last of the male heirs in a long line of French kings. The war began in 1337, marked with intermittent battles, and many in which the French outnumbered the English three or four to one because they're fighting on their homeland and the English have to travel. Nevertheless, the English win most of the early battles due to their new weapons, the foot soldier, the longbow, and gunpowder, the invisible enemy that would ultimately eliminate the personal element in military combat and probably begin to lead to the end of that kind of heroic literature like the Song of Roland um, and lead us more into literature that is about chaos. Along with the traditional Calvary, the English depended heavily on foot soldiers armed with longbows. The thin steel-tipped arrows of the six-foot longbow could be fired more quickly and of a longer range than the traditional crossbow. Because the thin arrow of the longbow easily pierced the finest French chainmail, plate mail soon came to replace chainmail. However, within the next few centuries, even plate mail became obsolete because it proved to be useless against gunpowder, or artillery that used gunpowder, more specifically. So gunpowder was introduced into Europe by the Muslims, who acquired it from the Chinese. Gunpowder was first used in combat in the Hundred Years' War. Although the English repeatedly devastated French armies throughout the Hundred Years' War, the financial and the physical burdens of garrisoning in French lands ultimately proved too great for the English. Facing a revitalized French army under the charismatic Joan of Arc, the English finally withdrew from France in 1450. Joan, of peasant background, 17 years old, begged the French king to allow her to obey the voices of Christian saints, telling her to expel the English. Donning armor, riding a white horse, she led the French into battle, and her success forced the English to withdraw from Orleans. But initiating her uh, martyrdom in the process, betrayed by her supporters in 1431, she was condemned as a heretic and burned at the stake. So the Hundred Years' War dealt a major blow to feudalism. By the mid-15th century, the French nobility was badly depleted, hand-to-hand -hand combat and other rules of medieval chivalry were outmoded, and the dramatically impersonal technology of gunpowder really was changing everything in the way that wars would be fought. Let's see here, that's what I wanted next. So the decline of the church in the Great Schism. 
So the growth of the European nation states and the growth of cities from charters continued to weaken the Christian Commonwealth, especially where the church and the state were competing for influence. Two events proved really damaging for the prestige of the church. The Avignon Papacy from 1309 to 1377 and the Great Schism from 1378 to 1417. The Avignon Papacy describes the relocation of the papacy from Rome to uh, Avignon in southern France. So this was response from political pressure from F uh, French King Philip IV attempting to compete in prestige and political influence with the secular rulers of Europe. The Avignon popes established a luxurious and powerful court using stringent and often corrupt means to accomplish their purposes. The increasing need of church revenue led to some of the Avignon pomps, uh, popes selling church office. And by selling these office, they are kind of giving away the spiritual authority. Also, they decide to levy taxes upon the clergy, elect members of their own family to uh, ecclesiastical office, and then also there are indulgences. Pardons from temporal penalties for sins committed by Christians that could be bought rather than doing the typical penance and trying to kind of change how your, your character is working. Christians bought them in order to speed up their own progress to heaven or to benefit their relatives and friends in purgatory. The return to the papacy in Rome in 1377 was followed by one of the most devastating events in church history, the Great Schism, a rift between the French and Italian factions in the College of Cardinals. This will lead to the election of two popes, one from Avignon, the other one from Rome. And for more than 30 years, there were conflicting claims on the universal sovereignty of each poem, pope and bitter controversy within the church. As each pope excommunicated the other, lay people question whether any Christian soul might enter heaven. The great schism proved even more detrimental, detrimental to the church prestige than the Avignon papacy. So Christians who regarded Rome as the traditional home for the papacy, the schism violated the very sanctity of the holy office. The arts during this transition. So in the 1300s, we find a preoccupation in class and gender and personality, in literature and in art, is a new fidelity to nature and personal experience in the everyday world, often described as a type of social realism. Boccaccio is a prolific writer in Italian prose and romances and lyric poetry. He was the first biographer of Dante, and he wrote the framework of the Decameron, which is uh, about the plague and people eager to escape the contagion. Young women and men retreat to a villa in the suburbs of Florence, where to pass time each tells a story on each of ten days. The stories are designed to detract, distract from the horrors of the pandemic and are, in effect, amusing secular entertainments. So his fables, his characters, resemble neither allegorical, allegorical figures of the everyman nor courtly stereotypes of Lancelot. Rather, they are realistically conceived, high-spirited individuals who prize cleverness, good humor, and the world of the flesh over the classic medieval virtues of chivalry, piety, and humility. And his Decameron must have had a special appeal for men and women who saw themselves as the heroes of an unstable and rapidly changing time. Christine de Pizan. So 
She is a French writer, uh, married to a nobleman when she was 15. She is the first professional female writer, and she's attacking the long anti-female tradition that had demeaned women and denied them the right for university education. Her feminism is all the more significant because it, it occurs at a time where men were making systematic efforts to restrict females and restrict inheritance of land, female membership in professional guilds. In an early poem, the epistle of the epistle of the God of Love, she protests the persistent anti-female bias of clerics and scholars with these words. Some say many women are defeatful, deceitful, wily faults, and of little worth. Others that too many are liars, fickle, flighty, inconsistent. Still others accuse them of great vices, blaming them much, excusing them nothing. Thus do clerics night and day, first in French verse, then in Latin, based on who knows what books, that tell more lies than drunkards do. So she believes in the right to female education and is also attacking male misogyny. Way to go, Christine. Chaucer, Geoffrey Chaucer, a contemporary of the two writers that I've just talked about, was a great master of vernacular literature in the 1300s and writing in the everyday language in Middle English. He was a middle-class civil servant, a soldier in the Hundred Years' War, a diplomat and a citizen of London, and he left an indelible image of his time in a group of stories known as the Canterbury Tales, modeled, modeled broadly on the Decameron by Bacchio. This versified human comedy was framed by Chaucer in a setting of the pilgrimage, whose participants tell stories to entertain one another while traveling to the shrine of St. Thomas, a, a, a Becket in Canterbury. Chaucer's 29 pilgrims include a miller, a monk, a plowman, a knight, a priest, a scholar, and provide a literary cross-section of late medieval society. Although they are type characters, they are also individual personalities. The partner, for instance, is portrayed as effeminate, while the wife of Bath is lusty. Chaucer's characters of the pilgrims are detailed, they have lively, humorous conversations, and they range from telling moral tales to beast fables and some risque body tales as well. Like his medieval pre uh, predecessors, he tended to moralize, reserving special scorn for clerical abuse and human hypocrisy. Giotto and Giotto's New Realism. So Giotto, he is a, a Florentine artist breaking with the decorative formality of the Byzantine Gothic style that we saw from Cimabue that had strongly influenced the style of late medieval altarpieces. In place of flat, stylized saints of the Byzantine icon, Giotto is introducing weighty, robust figures that are solemnly posed, set in shadow, but in convincing space, modeling form through gradations of light and shade, a technique known as chiaroscuro. He gave his figures a three-dimensional presence that had not been seen since Roman times. He brought this new realism to his panel paintings, but his most famous work is done in the family chapel of the Scrovinis and in Padua. 
In the walls of the chapel, he's illustrating familiar episodes of the lives of the Virgin and Jesus. And although wholly traditional subject matter, he is giving weight and volume to these figures and a type of nobility and dignity that call to mind classical sculpture. In the bottom image, the lamentation over Jesus, mourners are theatrically set in shadow, but in a carefully designed space. He's subtly varying the gestures to the degrees of sorrow, ranging from stoic despair of the Virgin Mother to grief-stricken anguish of the angels that flutter above the scene. Like the characters in the Decameron and Canterbury Tales, Giotto's figures are convincingly human. While not individualized to the point of portraiture, neither are they stereotypes. Here's a, another image of the, um, of the chapel. And again, as I had talked about last week, painting rather than mosaics is kind of the effect that we were seeing in the chapel that we looked at with St. Francis, St. Francis's chapel, where it's a little more modest rather than being so expensive. So the Italian Renaissance... The new realism in the arts and the increasing secularism, the spirit of criticism that accompanied the decline of the church is coming into focus into the cities in the Italian peninsula, the homeland of Roman antiquity. This is the least feudalized part of the medieval world. And we see in Florence where a cathedral that is dominating the, uh, the, the, the city is going to need a, a roof, ultimately. And 14th century Florence shopkeepers devise a system of, of accounting based on Arab models for tracking debits and credits. Double entry bookkeeping helps merchants to maintain systematic records of transactions. And the Florentine gold florin is going to become the dominant money. Handbooks on arithmetic, foreign currency, and even good penmanship are encouraging the commercial activities of traders and bankers. The pursuit of money and leisure, rather than the preoccupation with feudal and chivalric obligations, mark the lifestyle of merchants and artisans who live in the bustling city-states in Italy. Middle-class men and women are challenging canonical sources of authority that frowned upon profit-making and the accumulation of wealth. The old medieval values no longer make sense, and they are more interested in secular interests. There is also a rising interest in the Greeks and the Romans, and looked at as historical models for the enterprising citizens of the Italian states. Politically, Renaissance Italy had much in common with the ancient Greeks. Independent, disunited, the city-states of Italy were fiercely competitive, like the Greeks. As in the golden age of the Greeks, commercial rivalries amongst the city-states lead to frequent civil wars. However, such wars are always not fought by citizens who are merchants and generally ill-prepared for combat, but by professional soldiers whose loyalties are bought for a price. So in Florence, their rival city is Siena. So they are competing for financial wealth. They are competing for who has the best artist, who has the greatest cathedral, who has the most money. And ultimately, who's going to win is going to be Florence. So humanism is the resurgent study of classical antiquity 
at first in Italy and then spreading across Western Europe in the 14th, 15th, and 16th century. Humanists sought to create a citizenry able to speak and write with eloquence and clarity and thus engaging in civic life. This was accomplished through the study of the humanities, uh, today known as the humanities, grammar, rhetoric, history, poetry, and philosophy. So this renaissance that begins in Florence has a number of theories that I've talked about, but its political structure and the dominant family, the Medicis, the bankers, and the migration of Greek scholars and texts to Italy following the fall of Constantinople in 1453 from the Ottomans is going to kind of spur all of this on. Now, something else that we should remember that we're not studying in this chapter, but we'll be studying in chapter 9, is that the closing of Constantinople is going to lead to the, ex, the age of exploration. So when we talk about Magellan and Christopher Columbus and all of them, they are all living through this Renaissance, and that is a major part of the Renaissance that we won't be touching on uh, in this chapter or in chapter 8. The Medicis. So in the Medicis, we have a wealthy middle class, some 50,000 people, 100 families dominating political life, and the Medicis are a wealthy banking family that rose to power, and they gradually will take over the reins of the state, partly because of commercial, of commercial savvy of the Medicis, there is an enhanced material status of Florentine citizens. The Medicis will rule Florence for four generations. Cosimo and Lorenzo the Magnificent are probably the two most important Medicis. They are supporting scholarship and patronizing the arts. Their affluence is coupled with intellectual discernment and refinement taste inspired the Medici to commission works from artists like Brunelleschi and Botticelli, who we see here painting the Cosimo Medici at the Adoration of the Magi, uh, a new revisionist history of a Florentine uh, being at the birth of Christ. Uh, they are also going to support Verrocchio, who is the master who teaches da Vinci, and Michelangelo as well, who these artists are going to produce really the influential art that we will be looking at. So Lorenzo, like his grandfather, he is probably the most important um, of the Medicis after Lorenzo, the banker who really begins to set up his influence. So he's interested in, of course, gaining power. He is effectively reigning as a despot. People had little political freedom. However, his court includes artists, like I said earlier, Verrocchio, da Vinci, Botticelli, and Michelangelo. Uh, he also is interested in humanism and is supporting the poet Petrarch. He's writing poetry, and the humanists are now looking at the ancient Greeks and the ancient Romans and also trying to reconcile. How, the Greeks and Romans were pagans. How do you reconcile your faith in Catholicism and Christianity and also study the Greeks and the Romans. Petrarch. So Petrarch is the father, is known as the father of humanism in this era. He recovers, copies, and edits Latin manuscripts. He is traveling all over Europe looking for hand-copied manuscripts that he could not beg or uh, buy from monastic libraries, and he is amassing a library of about 200 volumes. He is reviving letter writing, he is, uh, which had practically disappeared. Uh, he is, in his letters, eulogizing and imitating Cicero, the ancient Roman, in his polished prose style. 
which stood in refined contrast to the corrupt Latin of his own time. His letters reveal a profound influence of Augustine's Confessions, a work that Petrarch deeply admired. He's torn between Christian piety and his passion for classical antiquity, and he is experiencing recurrent psychic conflict. In his writings, there is a gnawing, unresolved dissonance between the dual imperatives of his heritage and the Judeo-Christian, the Judeo-Christian who has to believe in the classical and reason, but is also tormented by the, uh, the, the theories and uh, ideas in Christianity. He is going to receive the honorary title of Poet Laureate. He has an affection for a Florentine woman uh, named Laura de Sad. Laura de Sad. Uh, Petrarch dedicates hundreds of love lyrics, many that were written after she died of the bubonic plague in 1348. His favorite poetic form is the sonnet, 14 line lyric poets, poems that also will influence Shakespeare later on. The rhyme scheme is difficult to replicate in good English of ABAB slash ABAB for the octave and CDE CDE for the sestet. Influenced by the sweet style of the Italian forebears, the more generally uh, sung by troubadours and Islamic lyric verse, Petrarch's sonics are a record of his struggle between the flesh and the spirit. Here's a little bit of Love for Laura, sonnet number 134. I find no peace, yet I am at war. I fear and hope. I burn and freeze. I rise to heaven and fall to earth's floor, grasping at nothing I would seize. Fisiano. So, Fisiano is uh, a humanist philosopher, encouraged by the availability of Greek resources, supported by Cosimo Medici. He is translating all of Plato's writings from Greek into Latin, making them available to Western scholars from the first time since antiquity. He finds the Platonic Academy in Florence, also financed by Cosimo Medici, and launches a reappraisal of Plato and the Neoplatonists that have major consequences in the domains of art and literature. Plato's writings, especially the Symposium, a dialogue in which love is exalted as a divine force. He advances the idea, popularizing that platonic or spiritual love attracts the soul to God. Platonic love becomes a major theme among Renaissance poets. Again, a love of someone that will never be consummated physically, but makes you into a better or the best person you can be through that love and through that generosity. Pico della Mirandola is a, um, undertakes the transla translation of ancient literary works in Hebrew, Arabic, Latin, and Greek. He's a poet and a theologian. And he is uh, talking about the ideas of free will and human perfectibility. He believes that you shape your own being and that it is not shaped by fate, but instead you have the free will and through your judgment to do so. That's a, a big idea considering where we've been over the last thousand years. So, both in personality and academic ambition, he typifies the activist spirit of the individual, affirming the unique self-fashioned potential of the human being. <coughs> Excuse me. 
So he believes intellectual expression is divine. And he writes about this in the Oration of the Dignity of Man in 1486, talking about moral freedom and perfectibility. Casale Leone is a Italian diplomat and humanist, maybe one of the more lasting figures that we kind of refer back to a lot. He writes the book of the Courtier, 1513 to 1518. He is part of the court in Urbino, a mecca for humanist studies in central Italy, and he is going to write that the ideal man should master all the skills of the medieval warrior and display the physical proficiency of a champion athlete, but he must possess the refinements of a humanistic education. He must know Latin and Greek and his own native language well, he must be familiar with the classics, speak and write well, and must be able to compose verse, draw, and play a musical instrument. He also believes that all of this should be done with nonchalance and grace. He believes that all of this, this combination of kind of perfected abilities, that the end game is to perfect the state. And that a courtier's uh, pr primary duty as a well-rounded gentleman is to influence the ruler who he's working for in the court to govern wisely. So his goal is to cultivate full potential as a human being. Now, he also has some ideas about the Renaissance woman. She should have a knowledge of letters, music, and art and should receive a humanistic education, but in no way should she uh, um, violate the soft, delicate tenderness that is her defining quality. Hmm. Casleone's peers agreed that in her ways, manners, words, gestures, and bearing, a woman ought to be very unlike a man, and believed that her skills in entertaining should be used to entertain the males in the court. So again, bit sexist here. And obviously his views are based on a narrow aristotic segment of society. So in other words, Casleone believes that manners rather than morals, how individuals act, is more important than the moral value of these actions. And therein lies one of the problems here. Now, the spread of books is happening because of the printing press. And the printing press is invented in 1455s in Germany uh, with Johann Gutenberg. And because of the printing press, that is going to lead to the profession of the writer because once you have the press and you've printed all the Latin and ancient um, uh, Greek manuscripts and Bibles, you still have a printing press. So you need writers. And that's where these individuals are starting to gain wealth and influence. Another one of the pretty important writers in this era is Machiavelli. Machiavelli is a civic humanist that is arguing that society's leaders must ex exercise virtue, self-confident vitality, and a self-made individual. This is a quality by which po powerful personalities, usually men, mastered fate, balanced against humanist ideas of the virtue and human perfectibility, however, were the realities of greed, ignorance, and cruelty. Personal ambitions and commercial competition is fueling frequent armed conflicts between the city-states. Gunpowder is making warfare increasingly impersonal. This is a time of greed where Renaissance popes are taking mistresses, leading armed attacks, and living very luxuriously. 
So Machiavelli is a keen political observer and a student of Roman history, and he is lamenting the uh, disunity of Italy in the face of the rivalry of these states. He's afraid that outside powers are going to take advantage of Italy's bickering and internal weaknesses. So Machiavelli writes The Prince in 1513, a political treatise that is calling for the unification of Italy under a powerful and courageous leader. He lays out the guidelines for an aspiring ruler and how they might gain political power. In The Prince, he argues that a need for a strong state justifies a strong rule. He believes that a prince should be schooled in war and in the lessons of history. A ruler must trust no one, least of all mercenary soldiers. He must imitate the lion in fierceness, but must also act like a fox to outsmart his enemies. And finally, in the interest of the state, he must be ruthless. And that preservation of a strong state will justify any means of maintaining that power. So when it comes to a ruler being loved or feared, Machiavelli believes that it's better and safer to be feared. So if the ruler does not win love, the ruler may escape hate by being feared. Renaissance art, early Renaissance art. So in early Renaissance art, we are moving not just solely from the patronage of the Catholic Church, but to merchants and petty despots, um, and also to middle-class patrons and urban guilds, lavish commissions that are bringing prestige pr to pr the prestige to businesses, families, and communities. So in this early Renaissance, in the quest for art, we see a a contest to put the doors on the baptistry of the Domo in front of Florence Cathedral. So the baptistry is a octagonal shaped building and maybe the most important building in Catholic life. This is where new converts are baptized. And on the doors, it is a contest to make the bronzes. And the contest comes down between two artists. Brunelleschi and Gilberte. Gilberte is ultimately going to win the contest, and the contest um, uh, is won now by Gilberte in a new kind of relief sculpture that is using perspective, not a hieratic scaling, but a actual hierarchy of size based on closeness versus what's further away and also based on linear perspective. Brunelleschi is not going to take the loss very well, but he is going to come back and we're going to talk about him quite a bit. So Gilberti will take 21, door, 21 years to complete the doors, gilded bronze doors with 28 panels, and the 28 panels depicting the life of Christ from the New Testament. The lower panels show the four evangelists and the church fathers, St. Ambrose, St. Jerome, St. Gregory, and St. Augustine. The way that he is depicting the images is going from high relief closest to us and low relief in the background. This is something that we will see in perspective drawing that is innovated by Brunelleschi. The Domo. So Filippo Brunelleschi, he is winning in 1420 a competition to design the Dome of Florence Cathedral. So he comes up with this new form of putting the Dome. So for about 200 years, Florence Cathedral had no Dome. He's going to come up with the lantern and the dome, and he's going to do this with pretty ingenious engineering. He is going to make eight curved panels 
joined by massive ribs that soar upward from the, oct the octagonal drum, and the section immediately beneath the dome will converge into an elegant lantern, lantern through which light enters the interior. The space between the two shells, he designs an interlocking system of ribs that operate like a hidden flying buttress that we saw on the Gothic cathedrals. He is also going to design the tools to create um, the dome. So he's designing uh, machines that can raise uh, up the uh, equipment, and his uh, uh, ideas are ultimately going to work. And he's going to hold the whole dome together with these bands, kind of like how a barrel is held together. Leon Battista Alberti. He is sharing with Brunelleschi the harmonious proportions of the ancient Romans. He's writing treatises on painting and sculpture and architecture. He is following the writings of Vitruvius and his 10 books on architecture. So he's modeling his work on Vitruvius and that architectural design should proceed from the square and the circle, the two most perfect geometric shapes that can also resolve each other as well. And this is going to become kind of a defining principle in high Renaissance composition. When we look here at the nave of the church of San Andrea, you can almost see the perspective drawing here. The barrel vault, the perfect circle window, the squares that are making up the ceiling like we saw in the Pantheon in ancient Rome in their dome. These are being revived in Renaissance architecture and somewhat define them. In early Renaissance painting, we are aided by Leon, uh, by Brunelleschi, once again, Filippo Brunelleschi. So Brunelleschi is going to come up with the invention of linear and one-point perspective, a way to translate three-dimensional space onto a two-dimensional surface. So we are looking at uh, translations of Arab treatises on optics and optical devices and lenses, and Brunelleschi is for formulating, like the camera obscura, by the way, and Brunelleschi is formulating the first laws of linear perspective. So he finds that converging lines or parallel lines appear to converge at a horizon line. And from that vanishing point, you can begin to set up a grid. And on that grid, you can create very convincing space. This becomes really the easiest way to identify early Renaissance painting, like Perugino's delivery of the keys here. This is one of the second floor frescoes in the Sistine Chapel that we'll be looking at. And that entire second floor is based on long perspective. Now here we see where Brunelleschi first tries out his new ideas. He uses perspective to make a painting of the baptistry, and then he cuts a hole in the painting. And he uses a mirror that he holds in front of the painting while uh, pointing the painting towards the mirror. So now he can see the actual baptistry, and he can see his painting of the baptistry at the same time. And what he finds is, through his discovery of perspective, they line up. And so this is going to be a huge discovery in art that is no longer flat. In Renaissance art, we are going to find a love of exact anatomy, even cutting into cadavers. Da Vinci is doing that to discover how the body operates. The chiaroscuro, the three-dimensional figure that goes from light to dark, and then also linear perspective. They define painting 
uh, in the per, in the Renaissance and really still today in art schools in general. Now Botticelli. Botticelli is a uh, uh, one of those great um, artists who is a follower of perspective. He is less interested in the illusionistic effects. Um, he is primarily a painter of religious subjects, but he's also interested in classicism as well. In Primavera, we uh, are looking at a painting in the townhouse of Lorenzo Medici, Lorenzo the Magnificent. We're seeing mythological figures in a garden that is allegorical of the lush growing of spring and sometimes cited as illustrating the idea of Neoplatonic love. Gothic sculpture. So in Gothic sculpture, we kind of start with Donatello. This is Donatello's Saint Mark here. Notice with Saint Mark, compared to earlier Gothic sculpture, we are seeing the physical body. We're seeing the veins in the hand. We're seeing deep uh, concentration marks in the face, standing clearly in contraposto, like the ancient Greek sculptures. This leg is resting, this leg is bearing the weight. What Donatello did is he would make a clay model and then cover the clay model in drapery to see then how to sculpt his marble sculptures. And this is again a new age in sculpture. The Medici Palace, also quite fascinating, designed by uh, Bartol Bartolomeo. It is built between 1444 and 1484. He's using Roman and Brunelleschian principles. The rusticated masonry and massive cornice that caps the palace clearly defines the building's outlines like early Roman buildings. He is expressing rationality and order and classicism, and all three floors have a slightly different feel to them, the older Roman style on the first floor. It looks like a fortress from the outside, and it's very different from the inside, which I'll show you next. In the courtyard, this is where the Medicis can meet people in the pater familius or the patrician, the ancient Roman way of gaining favors uh, for business and for political means. On the second floor are where the Medicis live and also where they entertain. And then on the top floor are their guests and also their workers and their guards. What I think is remarkable is how different the interior space is. Kind of forbidding on the outside, very white and inviting on the inside. One interesting part of this is a young teenage Michelangelo is going to be staying in the palace along with the other writers and the other artists, and he is going to design the windows. And he creates these windows that have consoles that are supporting the window sill, window sill, which almost appear to be kneeling. These, um, these window sills and the consoles, this is going to be kind of an important idea when he does the Laurentian library here. So the library is the library of the Medicis, Michelangelo is going to design this for them. This is the reading space here, lots of windows, lots of classical circles and squares. Michelangelo has learned well. But I think what's most remarkable here, and this might be my favorite artwork in all of the Renaissance, the vestibule. Michelangelo is clearly one of the greatest sculptors of all time, uh, also a great painter. But he also changes architecture and, and might be as influential in that as anything. So the staircase, carved out of marble, takes up about three quarters of the room. 
rather than normally about one quarter of a room. The middle staircase appears to be water flowing out of the library. It's a sculpture. It's not just a staircase. It is also a sculpture. And that is an idea had never occurred to me before. And then decorating the vestibule, he is using the language of classicism, the pediments, the pilasters, the shapes, but he's using them to decorate. So the pilasters have no real architectural value in terms of holding up the building. We have real windows on the third floor, fake windows on the second floor, and then the consoles that we had seen earlier that appeared to be kneeling, they appear to have no architectural value at all. They are simply hanging on the wall because they can. So we are now playing with architecture principles from the past, not to build buildings that are architecturally stable in the same way, but simply to be flamboyant and to decorate. And the Baroque style of architecture is going to follow this profoundly. Last part of this lecture is the High Renaissance. So Pope Julius II, the warrior pope, is going to commission Bramante to rebuild St. Peter's Cathedral. The architect designs a monumentally proportioned, centrally planned church to be capped by an immense dome. He's going to modify the plan and it's going to take 120 years to complete. And in fact, Michelangelo will take over planning the facade that appears to look like the muscular torsos that he'll be painting. He also, Bramante, has designed a smaller temple marking the site of Peter's martyrdom, Peter who is the first Roman pope. Modeled on the classical Thalos, a rounded temple, his shrine is ringed by a simple colonnade topped by a dome and then also shows a kind of perfect coming together of a circular structure. There is, it is a perfect structure from which nothing can be added or nothing can be subtracted without damaging the whole. Andrea Palladio, he is also responsible for writing about uh, architecture in his four books on architecture, published in Venice in 1570. He is defending symmetry and, centr and centrality as the controlling elements in architectural de uh, design. The Villa Rotunda that he creates is a perfectly symmetrical structure featuring a central room or a rotunda covered by a dome. But it also shows us a perfect coming together of the square and the circle as well. Leonardo da Vinci. So more than any Renaissance figure, da Vinci kind of fulfills the idea of the artist as a creative genius. He said, I wish to work miracles in his notes. His drawings and his sketchbooks of the embryo in the womb that we're looking at is a, the first time that there had ever been a drawing of this. He is insistent on direct experience and experimentations in science. He is interested in this coming together of uh, observation and also innovation. So in this drawing here and in his sketchbook, he is writing backwards. He is coming up with uh, fantastic ideas like helicopters and parachutes. He also is uh, massively consumed with water and how to make aqueducts, how to change the flow of rivers. Uh, and he also creates the hydrometer that measures the density of water. His portraits also 
are really influential. Rather than portraits being side views like Roman coins, and rather than being directly facing the viewer, he does the three-quarter portrait. And we see an earlier portrait, girl with an ermine, and a later portrait, the Mona Lisa. The Mona Lisa is one of the first paintings to be displayed in a landscape rather than in a domestic setting. He is using aerial perspective, a bluing of the background, and his sfumato is a smokiness that he does with hundreds of thin glazings of paint that are transparent, and what they allow is for light to go through the transparent glazes, hit the surface, and the light bounces through and creates a glow in the skin. Oil paint in done in this manner uh, is the closest thing to ever creating the actualization of human skin. It creates kind of the glow of the heartbeat. It creates a sense of wetness in the skin. His fresco, The Last Supper, uh, is a disaster in terms of the technique that he's using. He is mixing tempera and fresco, which is using wet plaster. Uh, and while the plaster is wet, you put the paint on. This is a complete restoration of the fresco that we're looking at. The Last Supper is a one-point perspective with the vanishing point right behind Christ's head. And then it is symmetrical between the disciples. But what I think is most remarkable in this fresco is the dining hall, the, mo the monk's dining hall that it's in. Here's the dining hall here. Notice the other frescoes on the wall, which are leading into the illusionary frescoes. So in other words, the real room is being continued into the illusion of a room. And as the monks are dining, they are dining in the exact space that the Last Supper is taking place in. And that illusion of space is also going to be very important when we talk about the Baroque era. Later on, we will talk about his Vitruvius Man in our discussion. He is interested in a figure that has two superimposed positions with his legs and arms apart, inscribing a circle and a square. Uh, Vitruvius refers to the ancient Roman architect that had been revived um, in the Renaissance. And then we are also seeing a kind of everyman that uh, um, is drawn probably out of the head of Leonardo. And the interesting part about this is where the circle comes from. So drawn with a compass, there's a small hole where the belly button is that gives us the center of the circle. And let's remember that the center of the body is not the belly button. The center of the body is the pubic bone here. So we are kind of getting this illusionary center from the actual center of the body. It's an example of his interest in proportion, mathematical proportion, rather than the actual proportion. Those musical proportions from Pythagoras that we see in the canon of uh, Polykleitos, the Greek, arch uh, the Greek uh, uh, sculptor of classicism. All of those ideas of mathematical perfection coming back again. Raphael would be the second of the three great artists, Michelangelo, da Vinci, and Raphael. He is a master painter, and his uh, portraits are um, as good as anyone. He's also using optics. His early paintings, to me, look a lot like Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, as we're looking here at the Cowper Madonna, uh, depicting Madonna and child, we are seeing idealized faces rather than actual faces. We are seeing also deep perspective, showing his mastery of perspective. The Madonna is typically shown in red and blue. 
the red signifying the blood of childbirth, and the blue signifying her acceptance of the death of her child. So he is influenced by Pirogino and others, and is also working in the Sistine Chapel. Now the difference between his early work and later work of, say, Pope Leo X, what we're seeing here is probably him using a camera obscura, a device that allows you to take an image from the real world and project it on a canvas in color upside down, and then to draw that image carefully, painstakingly, and realistically. So his early work stylized much in the vein of da Vinci from mastering chiaroscuro, perspective, anatomy, proportion, later work done through the aid of optics. Here, we're looking at a kind of unflattering portrait of Pope Leo X, the Pope who ultimately is going to maybe be most responsible for the German Reformation. Selling indulgences, all about wealth. He is what happens when the Medicis buy the papacy. So he is part of the Medici family. We see him with a magnifying glass, again showing optics and owning books. And then his nephew cardinals, are shown with kind of five o'clock shadows, and they kind of look a little bit rough. They look like they could be mafia types. And again, not a particularly flattering portrait of this pope. The Stanza della Signatura is uh, maybe his greatest overall fresco. There are four major frescoes here. This would be the Pope's library, and he would be working on this around the same time that Michelangelo was painting the ceiling. Apparently, they did not care for each other. Also, Michelangelo and da Vinci not, did not get along either. A lot of rivalry in these individuals. What is often cited as maybe the greatest painting in the uh, Renaissance might be the, the single painting, might be the School of Athens. In the School of Athens, we see a giant fresco that shows the mastery of Raphael's perspective. The squares laying down in space, the single vanishing point, we see the arches and the architecture all perfectly laid out. And then a mythical collaboration of Plato on one side, Aristotle on the other side, Plato pointing up, Aristotle pointing down, Aristotle and his empirical method only believe what you can see in science and those followers, and we see Raphael peeking out over here, and then Plato, the people who believe in the perfection of the mind rather than the perfection of physical realities, and a brooding Michelangelo over here. His cartoons. So he is commissioned in the High Renaissance to show the uh, scenes from the Gospels and the Acts of the early apostles. So very few of these cartoons um, survived. Uh, they were commissioned by Pope Leo for the tapestries for the Sistine Chapel. So we can see one of the early cartoons here that would be used then to weave the tapestries. The tapestries were spun in Brussels where the masters were in this art form. And then the tapestries made up the first floor of the Sistine Chapel. So if you've ever been to the chapel or know about the chapel, you of course know about the work by Michelangelo on the ceiling. And then of course, the great last judgment uh, that is the backdrop from where the Pope would do his mass at. The second floor, we see the long perspective paintings that were done by artists like Botticelli. Um, again, all showing long perspective, mastery of perspective, which Michelangelo foregoes in the ceiling because that had already been done. Michelangelo is going to make the massive figures 
and he is going to try to take the attention away from the second and the third floor here. But I think when the tapestries, which were shown recently, all the tapestries which were looted in the sack of Rome, and if you've ever seen the Sistine Chapel today, there are kind of not very nice paintings of just blank hanging tapestries. No real tapestries, no image in the tapestries. They are simply kind of overall blank and blah. And because of that, they really draw your attention to the ceiling. But the tapestries, again, by Raphael, and Raphael is paid four times as much as Michelangelo is paid for the ceiling. These tapestries really stole the attention from everything else. And I think if they were in permanently uh, in the chapel today, uh, I think we would have a very different relationship in how we think about it. Michelangelo. So Michelangelo, uh, he uh, establishes his reputation in Florence when he carves a statue of David. He also, a couple years earlier, carves the Pieta, a youthful Virgin Mary done in the uh, old Greek way of perfecting thirds from the forehead to the top of the head, from the forehead to the bottom of the nose, from the bottom of the nose to the chin, and showing the beauty of the Virgin Mary, a youthful virgin who wouldn't be this age when she has her adult dead son in her lap. And there was a contest really between painters to see who could paint the most perfect Virgin Mary, not based on any one woman, but based on the idea of Greek idealization and math. And what Michelangelo seems to do here is put down the trump card and say, yeah, all of you can paint this, but I made it come to life. In this marble statue, we see her charity, we see her beauty, and also her legs are being extended. Michelangelo is going to be well aware of the proportions of the Greeks and the Romans, but he is going to find that extending the body is going to create more emotion in the body. And this is going to start a school of painting in the late Renaissance called Mannerism that will ultimately lead to Baroque art. And in Mannerism, we have less interest in clear space, more confusing space, and then more emphasis on gaining emotion in the body. The Sistine Chapel. And I think in your textbook on page 208 and 209, this is the greatest part of our textbook. We have a two-page illustration of the ceiling. And then we have a diagram from Jonah on the far left uh, to Zacharias and the drunkenness of Noah to the far right. In the middle is the creation of Adam where Adam is reaching up for his brain. He's not being given life by a muscular kind of sexy God who's showing like really muscular legs here. And God is reaching out to give him a brain with, wrap, with Eve wrapped around his arm. And you can see this at a distance, the outline, a cutaway of the human brain and the brain stem. What God gave us is this fabulous brain. He is going to paint the Sistine Chapel and also design a scaffolding that is movable that doesn't have to drill holes into the existing walls and into the existing paintings. And he's going to achieve this incredible feat of painting the entire ceiling and dividing it with illusionary architecture. So the architecture that you see painted here that is dividing the stories of the Bible and the prophets and the Sibyls is a, an illusionary style of painting, like a comic book uses black outlines, but done with architectural elements. In a way, it's maybe the greatest comic book ever made, if I could say it like that. Later on, after the sack of Rome, after Raphael's tapestries have been stolen, he paints the Last Judgment. And in the Last Judgment, 
He is painting these nude figures. There are church officials that are upset by this, and they cannot tell Michelangelo no. In The Last Judgment, we see these muscular torsos, elongated bodies with very small heads, and it is closer maybe to his sculptures where the figures are coming out from each other. We see the saved people going up to heaven on this side of the fresco. We see a flayed body representing Michelangelo on the right. And then at the bottom, we see hell and we see the gaping maws of hell and also a representation of one of his detractors with a serpent around his body and the head of the serpent biting his genitalia. So the original work here is kind of one of the defining features of the uh, coming mannerism and the Renaissance. Uh, it took more years to paint this than to paint the ceiling. Of course, he's much older at this time period. And after he dies, they are going to hire an artist to cover up the penises uh, because they can't handle it. And so uh, the original painting has been changed from Michelangelo. And it's funny, they waited a few years after he died, just in case he came back, I guess, uh, to, uh, to cover up his work. And the last thing that we get from Michelangelo is his reworking of Bramante uh, and doing the facade, the front of St. Peter's Basilica. Largest basilica in the world, not done in the cruciform way that we see other churches done in the Renaissance and the Gothic era, but the old basilica, the old Roman public building with the large dome, the facade, and then ultimately the courtyard that will be designed and covered in sculptures by Gian Lorenzo Bernini, who we will study in the Baroque section. What's interesting, I think, about Michelangelo's facade is that it very much is reminiscent of his early experiments in the vestibule in the Medici's library, and I think it has the muscular quality of his torsos reimagined as architecture. So when we compare the coming Baroque to Renaissance architecture, again, Renaissance architecture, very sober, very rational, very much about geometric purity. But after Michelangelo, a Baroque architecture is about light and shadow and decoration, flamboyance and undulations. Also, when we look at Michelangelo's sculpture like David, David is a massive sculpture that he does in his 20s of Jewish King David about to slay a Assyrian giant to win a war for the Jews. He is without emotion in his face, like a classical sculpture in contrapposto form. He has the slingshot over his shoulder, the stone in the other hand, and he is just intensely but patiently waiting for the giant to get close enough to sling that one stone that is going to make his destiny. It's classical Greek sculpture all the way. From Bernini in Baroque sculpture, we get something that is reminiscent of Hellenistic sculpture. L same subject matter, David, the slingshot, but look at the emotion in David's face. And notice also the swirling action of David. This is not pre-action, this is mid-action. Again, very similar to Hellenistic sculpture from the Greeks. A little bit of the High Renaissance in Venice. So Venice is a city um, that is engineered on water, uh, governed by a merchant aristocracy, importing costly tapestries, jewels, and luxury goods from Asia. 
they are in a unique point for that kind of trading, and they are producing art of color and light, whereas in Florence, the art was dependent mostly on line as a fundamental design. The Venetians are interested in color, oil paint that had per been perfected in Northern Europe instead of frescoes, and also a unique form or unique forms of uh, architecture like the Doge's Palace, one of the landmarks of Venice, a city that is dependent on waterways for travel uh, and engineered on swamp um, with, again, fantastic wealth due to where they are in the vicinity with the East in trade. Great artists include artists like Giorgione, um, again, one of the fabulous painters in terms of the skills of the Renaissance. But in this particular painting called The Tempest, this has been referred to as the first landscape painting in Western history. We saw some landscape paintings coming out of China in the Song Dynasty with a vertical format. We are going to increasingly, especially when we get to Dutch paintings, in the Baroque, we are going to see a landscape format for landscape paintings that is more horizontal than vertical. So notice besides the whatever allegories are happening here between mother and child and the dude here going uh, uh, looking at her, the painting really seems to center on the landscape and the coming storm, which is why we often talk about this as kind of the beginning of landscape painting. Perhaps, though, the greatest of all the painters is Titian. Titian, in his early work, is really engaged in color, in classical, um, in classical subject matter, and later on in his life, the color begins to fade in favor of more brownish paintings and a thicker paint done with palette knives that is going to really be influential on the Dutch painter Rembrandt, who we will study later. Renaissance music. So music is being increasingly freed uh, in range and rhythm, harmony and form. Uh, in, uh, on the other hand, the rules of counterpoint is going to be a technique of two or more melodic lines or voices complementing each other and acting independently in polyphony. And we see polyphony in Josine, uh, um, Josquin de Pre, uh, in de Pre's uh, uh, music. He is polyphonic. He is creating maths around a single musical theme. Uh, in the grand style of the painter Raphael, he's contriving um, complex designs um, with a kind of symmetry and geometric clarity. Basically, word painting, where the text, as an example, where text describes a bird's ascent and the music might also rise in, uh, in pitch. The word painting is characterized, uh, characterizing both religious and secular music. They are creating a musical texture through imitation where melodic fragments are introducing the first voice and repeated closely in the second, third, and fourth voices. One of his most important compositions is Ave Maria. The other thing that we're getting from Adrian Villart is a madrigal. And the madrigal is a type of vernacular song that is a composition for three to six unaccompanied voices. And the occasionally an instrument might replace the voice in a four or six part madrigal. And it's usually polyphonic. So first, Let's listen a little bit to Ave Maria by Dupre, and then uh, we will listen to a bit of a madrigal by Villard.
And then here is a madrigal. So in Renaissance music, we are also seeing an interest in instrumental music. In London, we are, um, uh, we are finding a, uh, a building of 14,000 lutes in a one-year period from 1567 to 1568. There is a wide variety of other instruments like trumpets and trombones and drums. The invention of the clavichord and the harpsichord are ultimately going to be new types of keyboard instruments that will inspire the piano and organ later on. And then we are looking at instrumental compositions that are performed independent of dance, I'll talk about dance in a second, but are developed out of dance tunes with strong rhythms and distinctive melodies. Now in Renaissance dance, we have um, uh, the first treatise of dance that is uh, written in the art of dancing. And Guglielmo uh, Ebrio is a choreographer, and he is calling these lively dances balis, an Italian word which is the, the French word ballet is derived from. So there are three forms of Italian dance. You have the basset, or the slow, solemn, ceremonial dance. Also, the saltarello, a vigorous three-beat dance featuring graceful leaps. And the piva, a rapid tempo with double steps. These dances we are going to see developed as we go into looking at ballet in our coming lectures. For your discussion, I would like you to watch Vitruvius Man, a BBC documentary. It's about 25 minute longs, long, longs. And I would like you to give examples from the video that justify that I can tell that you've seen the video uh, about why you think that this captures the public imagination. What do you, why do you think we respond to idealized proportions and certain mathematical concepts? Why do they keep showing up in art and in music? And then the last question uh, has less to do with the video and more um, of all of the art that we've seen. What do you like most about the Italian Renaissance? What is your favorite work of art? And I'm curious to know why. So don't just tell me what it is. Also tell me why. What it is about it that you respond to. I look forward to seeing what you write. And we will go over the Northern Renaissance the next time we meet. Bye, everybody.